Dobar dan, good day everybody. It's my big pleasure, respected excellency, that I will, that I having you today here with this uh, panel, we will talk about culinary diplomacy. So, allow me first of all that I introduce um, our special guest, Her Excellency Keti Chaba, the ambassador of Canada in Republic of Serbia. <laughs> then Her Excellency Alona Fisher Kam, the ambassador of Israel in Republic of Serbia. <laughs> then of course here is also His Excellency Mr. Subrat Bata Chardi, the ambassador of India and Republic of Serbia. <laughs> and of course, uh, His Excellency Mr. Marco Antonio Garcia Blanco, uh, ambassador of the Mexican Republic of Serbia. <laughs> so different countries, different stories, and different uh, culinary taste. First of all, I uh, will like uh, that uh, maybe each of you uh, introduce yourself. I want that people know actually um, where you are coming from Serbia, which country you visit, and which your favorite taste you remember in your world journey. Uh, I know that a lot of, it's very difficult question, but if each of us, we have a, our basic taste, who is from our uh, country where we are born, and this taste will never forget it. So there is always in us, and we are always searching for taste of my uh, mother kitchen or grandmother kitchen, village kitchen. But there is also, because of a job, it's very uh, interesting, you travel a lot. So let's say us which cuisine you are remembering in your world travel. So, Mr. Keti Chava, please. Thank you. So uh, I'm from Canada, as you can as you can guess. Uh, born in Montreal, but grew up in uh, in Ottawa, and I I came to Serbia having lived for two years in Ethiopia. So that was my last uh, my last flavors of food uh, before before coming here. Very interesting cuisine. Uh, it's very vegetarian based. So uh, so for those of you who are vegetarians or vegans, it's a, it's an interesting place to go. Um, so the, if I think of the foods that are most evocative for me, uh, I would have to say on the one hand Hungarian food. My father is originally from, from Hungary uh, and, uh, and so I grew up eating my grandmother's cooking, uh, which was delicious, Hungarian food. My mother is from the, from the US, from Texas as a matter of fact, and so, um, so I also grew up eating Tex-Mex food, which is very similar to Mexican food, so also a big favorite in my life, but having traveled, as you say, in many different countries, I've lived uh, in a number of countries in Eastern Europe, besides, uh, besides in Ethiopia, uh, and I love, I love aspects of the food from every country that I've visited, so, uh, so from across Europe, parts of Asia, uh, Central America, and so on, many okay. different lovely cuisines. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the beginning, also, Your Excellency Alona Fisher, come. do you have some rememberable taste of some world food? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm the ambassador of Israel, and Israel is a country of immigrants. Uh, so uh, I have different origins. My mother is from, her origins are from Poland, and we heard about the Polish cuisine, and from Belgium, and my father is from Austria and from Germany. Uh, so from, from childhood, what I have in mind is mostly the Austro-Hungarian food on the one hand, and on the other hand, maybe the Belgian, and of course the traditional Polish food, because when we talk about traditional food, since uh, there was a huge Jewish community coming from Poland, then uh, Poland had a lot of influence on our, on our cuisine. Uh, I come from Tel Aviv, I'm very proud of being born in Tel Aviv and raised in Tel Aviv, and one of the reasons why I like Tel Aviv so much is uh, exactly the restaurants, the variety, the diversity of restaurants and light, nightlife uh, in this city. What do I take from, uh, where I, from my different uh, journeys around the world? I served in Argentina, I served in, in France and in uh, Spain. I don't think I have to mention that <laughs> there are very good cuisines in each one of these countries. 
Uh, I really love Serbian food, but I must say that I arrived in quite bad timing because I'm in a process, I'm doing it quite gradually, but I'm in a process of being vegetarian and I don't think that this is the right place to be, <laughs> to be right now. But uh, I do like Serbian, uh, Serbian food and I take from each country something, I don't know, from Argentina, I would take the alfajo. Uh, and from France, probably the croissants amand, and from Spain, mostly the paella. Paella, okay. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Subrat Bhattacharji. You also travel a lot, I see in your resume, so. Yes, I, I, I belong to the eastern part of India. India is a very large country. I'd say the province of Calcutta, not the city of Calcutta. Uh, in my postings abroad, I have been to over 50 countries, but lived in just eight of them. And each in of eight of those countries have a place in my heart. But the way to man's heart is through stomach. So the food from all these countries found place in my stomach. I really can speak for a day on that, but I'm going to talk about just four pieces of food that I really enjoyed in these four different countries. I begin with Bangladesh. In every country of ours, and I speak the same language as Bangladesh, same mother tongue. So I, I shared a lot with Bangladesh. And there I enjoyed something called hill surface. It's a typical of Bangladesh, available also in my part of India. It's something like herring. The food is cook, cooked in a very special way. You the, take the fish flesh and marinate it with yogurt, ground mustard seeds, that's very important, and some sliced chilies to bring that pungent taste and then leave it overnight. And next morning, you add some mustard oil, not too much of it, because the fish itself has a lot of fish oil, omega oils, and then wrap it in green banana leaves. And then you can just bake it. You can steam it, or take out the curry part and fry it, and then serve it wrapped in green banana leaves. By the way, the fish has a lot of small fish bones, but you can always marinate in for a longer, for a day, in with a little bit of vinegar. So the foreigners who find it difficult to tackle the fish bones will pray for that version of the <laughs> fish. But the, the 24 hours marination will dissolve all the, all the fish bones. Should I talk more? Maybe I can talk with turkey. There I enjoyed pide. Pide, everybody knows, pide is a flat Turkish bread. But I like more how to serve the food. It comes with the topping, mushroom, chicken, Lamb does not bread the way they serve. There on a long wooden platter, two to three feet long platter, they put the pide, and the waiter will come as an Ottoman guard with the turban, he will come with the sword, not to attack you, but then he'll slice the pide <laughs> and serve it to you. So I love that most. I also talk with about Germany. I served there twice. My two daughters were born in Bonn in Germany, and I love their traveling to Black Forest or Schwarzwald. And my two daughters love eating Schwarzwald's kiss, kiss daughter, the black forest cake. That was something lovely they enjoyed. Thank you so much. Actually, uh, from my perspective, the Indian and Mexican the cuisine, it's uh, worldwide now, so uh, I don't think so that doesn't exist the place and the capital who doesn't have a restaurant of these two kitchen globally. So, uh, Mr. Marco Antonio Garcia Blanco, you also, your, your work experience is very big, you, you travel a lot, so what taste do you remember globally?
So let's uh, now talk a little bit about uh, your domestic uh, kitchen and the country's uh, your domestic recipe. So uh, your Excellency Katie Chaba, tell us what you want uh, to tell us about Canadian kitchen. A few things, in fact, and I have a little slideshow if that uh, if that can get started. Uh, so, first of all, as you know, Canada is a country also of of migrants, as uh, as my uh, Israeli colleague mentioned for for her country. Uh, so we have had influences from around the world over the course of our history. We're also a very large country, and we have, as you know, on the one coast we have the Atlantic Ocean, the other coast we have the Pacific Ocean, and then to the north the Arctic. So I have to say that fish and seafood are a huge part of our, of our food culture. We have wonderful seafood products, wonderful fish, uh, uh, both saltwater fish and freshwater fish, and, that, and that's a, an important element of our cooking. I have to also just put in a little plug to say that uh, one of the main importers of fish and seafood in Serbia uh, is going to be going on a trip to Canada in a, in a week or so to explore all of the varieties of fish and seafood in Canada and already import some, some fish but is looking to import a lot more. So this will be a great opportunity to be able to buy Canadian seafood products in, uh, in supermarkets across, uh, across Serbia. Another important element of our food is, of course, meat, like in every culture. Uh, we're, we're very famous for our wonderful Canadian beef, uh, primarily from Alberta. It's known around the world as being very high quality beef. But one of the areas that's, that's less known but is a real tourist attraction uh, is, uh, is eating meats from, from wild animals. So from deer, from elk, from, from moose meat and so on. And you have some pictures here of, of a deer loin steak or a moose sirloin. Uh, and these are things that are the indigenous people of Canada ate for, for centuries and that we have also come, uh, come to love and there's some great restaurants serving these foods. From indigenous cultures, we've also acquired some other interesting kinds of foods uh, that are also not very well known outside of Canada. Things like fiddlehead ferns. These are the ferns before they grow. It's just the start of them and when you eat them just at the right season, they taste uh, taste delicious. Wild rice is another typically Canadian product. So we have a, a variety of these foods that, that have been developed through our indigenous uh, people's cultures and then have become more, more mainstream. Next, uh, on the next slide, the quintessential Canadian product that is what everyone thinks of is, of course, maple syrup. Uh, it's a whole process to get it. You know, you have to put these plugs in, in the maple trees in the spring and then the sap comes out and you boil it down in the sugar house and uh, it takes about 40 liters of sap to make one liter of syrup. So it's quite an expensive product, but it's a delicious thing. We eat it on, on many things, pancakes, waffles and so on. Uh, so that's a, that's a really uh, also a, a, what is well, well known. Signature, the, signature. Yes, the signature uh, aspect of Canadian culture. If we flip to the next one, something that's less well known as well is, um, is Canadian wine. Uh, we have over the past probably 30, 40 years really, really invested a lot in our, in our wine industry. There are only a few areas of the country where you can grow wine grapes because the rest is, uh, is too cold. But, uh, but we have some great wineries. Uh, we don't export a lot because, uh, because the production is still quite limited. But a, a very typical Canadian wine product is ice wine. And you produce ice wine by leaving the grapes to freeze on the vines until the middle of winter. So all the flavor gets concentrated into these, uh, into these frozen grapes. And then you make a, a, a sweet dessert wine from that, which is very lovely. We're also known for, uh, for, for beer. Canadians are also big, big beer drinkers. And we have the big companies that make the typical Canadian brands. But, but again, over the past 20 or so years, there's been a huge boom in craft beer production. So these small beer producers who make very specific products uh, that are based on local ingredients and that, that appeal to local tastes. But what, I, I, what I'd conclude by saying is that Canada is a country where you, you have a, a huge range. You have very sophisticated food. If we, uh, you, know, you have fusions of different cuisines, so all of the different migrants who've come to Canada, all of their, their influences get felt in, uh, in these beautiful foods that are produced. Uh, but then you also have very simple foods like a traditional lobster dinner where you have foods fresh out of the sea with, you know, boiled potatoes and, uh, and it's, just a, it's just a really classic simple meal but that tastes amazing. 
Okay, so this is something, just short story uh, about uh, habits and uh, uh, gastronomy of Canada, but we will come back. So please, uh, Your Excellency Alona Fisher, come tell us something about uh, typical Israeli food. What we must to know about this food, about this cuisine? Uh, well, I would say that if I have to mention one thing that is an institution in Israel, you will be surprised. I will not mention the falafel, the hummus, and the trina. I will mention something completely different, which is the Israeli breakfasts. Uh, the Israeli breakfast is not food, it's not even uh, breakfast, it's an institution, it's a cultural institution. So this is a kind of uh, family event. Every weekend or almost every weekend the families are going out to have uh, a kind of breakfast or a brunch uh, in some restaurant which is very big and very diversified. It would uh, comprise of uh, of course, eggs and cheese, and a lot of so sorts of cheese, and then jam and uh, honey, and all kinds of breads, uh, and they will stay there for hours. Now, it started as a kind of family event, then it moved also to friends that would gather for breakfast, and today you have restaurants in Israel that are specialized in breakfast 24 hours a day. How does it work? It works. People want to have breakfast at midnight, <laughs> but this is fine. Yeah, so they nice. will get some breakfast uh, dishes there, although it's not, uh, it's not morning. And what it might be a bit interesting is the fact also that by the years it also became a kind of uh, business event. Instead of going to a very formal lunch with wine, with three courses, people want to have more non-formal surrounding for meetings and to, to have deals done, and they would choose breakfast. Uh, so it's a completely different style of doing business. So if you visit Israel and you have a chance to walk in the mornings in the, on the beach, it's not that people are not working. They work, they are just having fun while working, which is different. Yeah. So actually, what about uh, sweet food? In Israel? Sorry? Sweet food in Israel. Uh, well, we do like sweets uh, a lot, but I must say that this is not, it's not that it's not typical Israeli, but here maybe I have to say something about Israeli food in general, is that it is very diversified, but it's not diversified according to the regions. We are a small country, we are not Canada. Uh, so, and people are moving from one place to another and from one region to another. So, uh, it is diversified according to your origins. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for those who came from Europe, maybe the sweets is not the most important part of their, of their food, but if you came from Morocco or you came from North uh, Africa, in that sense, sweets are going to be a very important part of your, of your dish. When it comes to the Europeans, in my house it was mostly the Austrian-Hungarian food with the strudel uh, and with the castaner puree. And uh, I was very surprised to find out here something that I haven't seen for years, for years in Israel. When I was a child, I used to get, I remember from my very early childhood, something that I, my grandmother used to prepare me, which was sweet. It was a kind of a bowl made of uh, cheese with uh, plum inside. And when she died, nobody could tell me what it was and how she prepared it. And it is gone forever. It stayed something very remote in my memory. And then here in Voivodina, I found out that this is the gombots. <laughs> but it was house of Hungarian, a bit different. Here is krumpir, there, there, there is cheese, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, I had a possibility here to come back to my early childhood and taste something that I would never, I would never thought I would be able to, um, to taste again. So this is a kind of variety, and the sweets also present this variety and diversified uh, dish of Israel. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, Your Excellency Subrat Bata Charji. So, India, Indian food, very influential cuisine worldwide. 
with a lot of uh, taste. So, yeah, we have 1.3 billion people and a 5,000 year old history. So you cannot make 1 billion people to eat the same food for 5,000 years. They'll revolt. So we have a wide variety of food. I'm just going to pick five of them and talk about it. But before I talk about Indian food, a word of caution. You often encounter chilies in Indian curry. Remember, the chili was added just for adding taste to the food. It has done its part. Don't try to eat the chili. Set it aside. It has already given its part, the taste to the food. It's now for throwing it out, not to eat. Coming to the food now, let me begin with Sikh kebab. Sikh kebab is something, the kebabs will be known to the Serbians. Here you have a special iron rod and you make the mince meat and it passes through them. And now then grill it in a special clay oven. And of course you will have a lot of, you know, Indian spices added to it and hot in taste. And you can, you must have it with green mint sauce. That's must. Next thing that goes with the, uh, the, the, those uh, kebabs are the naan, Indian bread. You see one is being made now, huge in size. So you take the white throat dough. Traditionally, you add a bit of yogurt. But now people are adding yeast because to make it soft and fluffy. And then again, you know, warm it. It's, it's, uh, do it, bake it in a clay oven in open fire. I'm going to talk about the next, the, the sister of the naan. That's called rice, basmati rice. You know what Basmati word means because the earlier people tried to take a patent of the name, but luckily we could fight and not let them win. This is a special rice, long grain, with a faint, mild, pleasant aroma. And once you boil the rice, remember to strain the rice so that to let the, the starch solution go away. Because you don't want to add to your calorie, you want the test. And then you serve it with fresh green peas, you serve it with almonds, serve it with cashews, serve it with raisins to add to the taste. A good vegetarian dish I'm going to mention is called batar paneer. Paneer is called cheese, Indian cottage cheese. What you do, you make the cheese and squeeze out all the water by putting it under heavy weight and then slice them like a diamonds, diamond shape. And then you cook it with a lot of oil and curry and of course the butter, but not the butter you get in department stores. Clarified Indian butter, or call the key. You must cook it over a slow, slow, slow fire for a long time to get the right taste. One dessert I'm going to talk about is called gulab jamun, the berries. You must have tasted. Yeah, Mexican members have tasted those brown-shaped, you know, balls. Could be big, could be small. The key to making gulab jamun is first you make khoya. Khoya is called milk solid. You warm the milk under slow fire, over a slow fire, long, long time, so that all the water, finally almost all the water evaporates and you have milk solid. Then you mix it bit with wood flour and then fry it in a low fire for long time. It becomes, you know, rich brown color it acquires. And then you let it in a soak in overnight at least with a light sugar syrup. And of course you sprinkle to that things like uh, cinnamon and bit of cardamom and a lot of other stuff to add to the good taste and of course saffron. So these are the, with the five main foods and we have a lot of fish in the coastal areas. You can grill them, you can make them curry. Very same manner we are doing to the chicken and lamb. You can do it and I'm going to talk about something about uh, our dessert. I know we had a dessert, that's for the milk based dessert we have because we have a lot of vegetarians. They need to eat something. How do vegetarian people get the source of protein? If they don't eat meat, if they don't eat fish, they get only from two sources. One, the lentils that we eat with rice. Second, all the dessert, the milk-based dessert. And now talk about the drink that goes with Indian food. What drink goes well with Indian food? Chai, the tea. You have masala tea, spice tea. It com comes with cardamom and ginger. You can enjoy a sip, keep on sipping Indian masala chai after your meal. That's a good thing. Or you can enjoy lassi. Lassi is called yogurt drink. Plain yogurt drink, but not what you get in the Bambu store. You garnish it with roasted cumin seeds, with black salt, with bit of mint, and serve it after healthy, hearty North Indian meal. And in the mango season, you can serve mango lassi. And if you have a Western taste, India is growing now wines. 
We have a brand called Sula, which is being exported. And the Roje wine goes best with Indian food. So you can always try a glass of Indian wine. Where to go for food? You can order. There's an Indian restaurant here called Diwali. It's located near the near those Stadion, uh, Stadion shopping center. It's called Bhoja Bhoj. Bhoj, the Bhoj the Bhoj. That area, you can order food. Your tikka, shikka, kebab, naan, butter paneer, all I talked about, you can order from that place. Anything else, do let me know. I'll yeah. <laughs> WhatsApp you the Thank address you. of the <laughs> restaurant. Yeah. Thank you for now. So, uh, of course, the one of the very influential kitchen with good branding worldwide, it's Mexican cuisine. So, Mr. Garcia Blando, uh, what we must to know about Mexican cuisine, what we don't know yet? Okay. I would like to, to say that it is true that all gastronomies have points in common. Maybe the musicians uh, would say they have starvation of the same thing, you know? Uh, to the extent that they are using, in many cases, the same inputs uh, for their preparation. Uh, for example, uh, we all uh, eat rice, but we prepare it in a different way and with different ingredients, and despite evidence and similarities, uh, each country or region or culture has its own emblematic rice. So there are certain characteristics, inputs, or unique uh, manufacturing uh, techniques that give uh, each gastronomy uh, a unique personality that projects it to the world as something particular, something special. The Mexican cuisine uh, came, comes uh, from the fusion of the gastronomy of the pre-Hispanic era before the, the Spanish arrived to America, and uh, after that, the Spanish poker and the French invasion that we saw for the 19th century, uh, the European cuisine. Uh, it combines seeds, plants, and animals from both sides of the ocean, as well as different processing techniques. Uh, these mixtures, along with the horizons of Mexican gastronomy, uh, to expand and transcend the strictly pre-Hispanic or European. It is Mexican because it drains from both sources and is not limited to them. Uh, the Mexican culinary culture is constantly evolving because uh, it is open to the other cultures experiences and innovates without fear of losing its essence. In the case of Mexico, uh, its cuisine is based on corn and different uh, types of uh, peppers. But its richness, uh, richness and variety goes far beyond these two basic but not unique ingredients. In Mexico, uh, we have several gastronomic regions, each one with uh, diversity, peculiarities, and specific personalities. Reducing Mexican gastronomy uh, to corn and papers, it's a cliche that does not honor the culinary tradition of the millenary culture that have inhabited what it not knows as Mexico, and uh, leave aside contributions that now have a presence throughout the world, such as uh, chocolate, tomato, avocado, and tequila, to mention just a few. Uh, by the way, you allow me to say, when I was preparing these notes in my office, someone reminded me that the Mexican chefs uh, usually appears in the different rankings of what is composedly known as the best chefs in the world, and that according uh, to the world's 50 best restaurants at Freemark, with headquarters in the United States, his name in last April, Diana Sotlines, a Mexican chef, as the best female chef of the world in 2018, and that in 2010, Mexican popular cuisine was declared by UNESCO a cultural heritage of humanity. But without the merit uh, of the Mexican chefs of Mexican cuisines, I do not believe that one cuisine is better than another. I already say that. Uh, at the most, it will be different because uh, they are available and expressing a geographical reality and a specific culture. And this diversity is why it should be valued to celebrate human diversity and its different cultural expressions. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, I want to kindly ask you, I will give you one minute that you think about uh, what you want to recommend at us, like a menu. One appetizer, one main dish, and one dessert. The, the most... Um, 
most important one most very well known dishes when we come to India, what we must order when we come to Canada, what we must order uh, when we first time. Some people, you know, never go to Indian restaurant, Canadian food, they doesn't know Israeli kosher, so they doesn't know what is kosher, some of the people also mixing. So I give you one minute. So allowed me that I just mentioned some sponsors of uh, this event for talk, um, IMS Osiguranje, Imlek, Uncle Beans, Grad Novi Sad, i organizaciji uh, Color Media Communication. So, menu, Keti, you first. Okay, uh, I'll start with, I would suggest a typical, what we call surf and turf menu. Okay. So seafood and, and meat, so I would say an appetizer, could be something like a plate of raw oysters or a beautiful piece of lobster meat uh, as an appetizer. Then as a main dish, a beautiful big steak from, from aged Western uh, Alberta beef. Uh, and then finishing with, you know, with a, some kind of local dessert with, uh, with fruits or, uh, or something with maple syrup, of course. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Fisher, Alona, please. Three small things. First of all, I would go for shakshuka, for sure, for breakfast. Then salad, no doubt about it. Cut very in very very small pieces. Uh, it's a long preparation, and um, I would like to say two things regarding kosher because you mentioned kosher and many people ask me about kosher. Kosher, it's a kind of uh, it's the Jewish food restriction. More, many restaurants in Israel are kosher, but others are not, uh, because not Israelis are following all the restrictions, and because there are different restrictions for different kind of uh, religious people in Israel, there are lots of sectors of religion, and each one has its own, uh, its own restrictions. They have something in common. The most, I would say, is the fact that we don't eat, eat pork and we don't eat seafood. Uh, it doesn't mean that you cannot get pork or seafood in Israel, but this is not this is not a, this is not kosher. And then, the more religious you are, more restrictions, uh, most more restrictions you have. But last year, in the same event here, I ended with a slide about something that is very Israeli. It is called bamba. And bamba, I was for sure, I was so sure that this is a hundred percent Israeli that does not exist anywhere in the world. And then when I found, I came here and I opened one pack of uh, Bamba, uh, in the embassy, the serve said, but this is smoky. I said, no, this is not smoky, <laughs> this is Bamba. So we started to look at the Google and we found out the Bamba was founded in Israel a year before the smoky here. Mm -hmm. So I think that we do okay. have, so I'm not oh, only wow. talking, I promise this year. <laughs> wow, so nice. This is the smoky and this is the bamba. You are mostly welcome to taste it. <laughs> Better to do it blind without seeing and then to comment what would you think is the best. Okay. So, mo I will taste first. <laughs> So, uh, Your Excellency uh, Subrat Bata Chariji, tell us which kind of menu you recommended. Okay, for starter, I will say samosa. You must have samosas, those triangular things filled with potato and spice. And also, you should have paneer pakoras, those paneer sort of thing, this, you know, with put in a bladder and then fry it nicely. This could be a good starter and vegetarian. For the main dish, you must have on grill tandoori chicken. Tandoori chicken you must have, and also some curry, could be very spicy lamb curry, and one vegetarian dish could be the, 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 uh, the butter paneer with rich, you know, tomato gravy that you use, that should have the butter paneer. And then for the, for the other thing you must have the nuns, you can have it butter nun, putting a bit of butter in so you can save it longer, or you can have garlic nuns, or if you are health conscious, the plain nuns, and of course with basmati rice. And if you want to have some dessert after that, of course, I said talk to a gulab jamun. Rasagulla from my part of India. Here you take the large cheese balls, very soft. If you sweet, but if you squeeze it, all the, all the, all the syrup goes away. It's, it's a long preparation. 
you first you boil it and then you know sugar syrup but do it such a way that even soft still fluffy and all the and 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 the juice the syrup reaches to the very core of it sometimes people tend to put a small sugar cube piece of sugar cube inside to ensure that there is a sugar syrup all throughout the rasagulla that's how i recommend and you must not forget to have some yogurt plain yogurt or a yogurt lassi because that will help your digestion okay thank you so much and let's uh, let's uh, mr marco antonio garcia blanco tell us something about mexican menu what you recommended okay if you are looking something more sophisticated i will recommend to you uh, the mole it's a, it's a chicken with a part of a very a complicated sauce that we made with 74 different ingredients from uh, sugar chocolate uh, to salt hot peppers is uh, very traditional and very emblematic uh, from Mexico. That's a very sophisticated plate. But uh, our fast food are the tacos, no? The, 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 a corn tortilla is with some is the meat inside. You can add some guacamole or some uh, different kind of uh, sauces. And it's, uh, it's cheaper, it's nice. It's, uh, of course, we say that it's delicious. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> and maybe I, I can uh, suggest uh, this uh, basic. Okay, thank you. So, uh, both from the Serbian gastronomy, uh, you already try, and uh, what kind of taste is for you the best, let's say, Kate? Uh, I've tried many things, I know. fortunately. <laughs> I'm, I'm delighted to have had the opportunity, so much good Serbian food. I, I would say there are a few things that, that really appeal to me. There's wonderful meat in Serbia, particularly you know, in lamb season, uh, beautiful pork, uh, and very nice veal. Uh, somebody was mentioning on the early, earlier panel about sarma. I have tried sarma in, in many different countries, in Russia, in Ukraine, in Hungary, and I have to say that for me, Serbian sarma is the best of all of them. So I, okay. I, really, uh, I really love that. I love pita, of course, uh, yeah. different, uh, with different fillings. Um, but I think probably the thing that is the hardest to find, it's not possible to find in Canada, but it's such a, such a specialty here is uh, kaimak. Kaimak, maybe with a little ivar on the side, this would be for me the perfect, uh, perfect Serbian food. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Fischer? I think that for me it's gonna be the veal soup and the gibanitsa and as I said, uh, the gombots, uh, because this is part of uh, my own uh, my own history. Okay, thank you, and uh, Mr. Batacariji. Yeah, in the nine ten months that have been, I have just some Serbian food, but the bigger reason for that. So Indians are coming to Serbia in greater number thanks to the visa free regime, and we are having more and more Indian movie shooting. The six Indian movies have been shot in Serbia the past few years. One of them. The biggest, the largest blockbuster of this year in India, called Uri, was mostly shot. More than 90% was shot in Serbia. So those things are bringing more Serbia, Indian movie crews, actors, actresses, and the Indians, moviegoers are seeing those things, taking interest. So there is a good reason for promoting Serbian food among Indians. Coming to a few foods, chibabchi, there's no need to explain. It's like kebab of India. I would mention something called Miladi Sir. Smila, this is very similar to Indian paneer. At my home, my wife, my maids, they use it. We use it for making butter paneer, for making spinach paneer, for paneer pakora. It's just like Indian paneer. And other things, you can have, of course, things like musaka and burek. <laughs> These are not very much Indian, but India did not have a tradition of making food with, you know, an electric oven. So that some dishes will be suitable for Indian taste. And as Canadian ever says, Kaimak. My daughters used to have the homemade milk cream sprayed over the toast bread with, <laughs> with, with sugar, sugar sprinkle. <laughs> so we can do the same with Kaimak. If you want to have that alternative for the Indian homemade milk uh, cream is the Kaimak. And of course, Serbia has an amazing variety of fruits. You can mark the seasons with fruits. You name the season, you have a fruit. Name the fruit, you have a season. You have strawberry, you have berries, you have cherries. What you have, you have oranges, you have, you know, plum and everything. So a fruit platter, a fruit platter freshly cut fruit platter will appeal to Indian taste. 
especially the, those vegetarian ones. And of course, those who are interested in drinking, serve them with a glass of rakia. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So, Mr. Oh, Antonio. Easy, it's, it's easy to say because uh, you already have everything. Uh, uh, what you need maybe is a little more marketing, uh, maybe some kind of franchise that uh, organize your uh, gastronomic offer in order to promote around the world. Uh, I would like also to uh, suggest you all of me to say uh, uh, before replying with your, your question, uh, maybe uh, the, the issue related that organize some kind of safari, gastronomic safaris or uh, gastronomic tours. We are already doing this in Mexico and, and works properly. We received uh, last year 42 million international tourists in Mexico. Mexico is one of the 10 most visited countries in the world. And uh, the people, more of the people are going there just to enjoy a run, but uh, to try things in Mexico. And uh, that works just if you, if you need two things for that. Of course, the right uh, marketing, uh, but of course, uh, uh, the most important is the wrong uh, gastronomic uh, tradition. You already have. You have excellent wines, you have excellent food, general terms. Uh, I enjoy a lot uh, the bean soup. I think it's very characteristic and very dramatic from uh, Serbia. Uh, uh, you can find it in other places, but not as in Serbia. It's, it's, it's a different issue. No, it's a very particular issue here. Uh, of course, I enjoy also the uh, lamp. Uh -huh. uh, uh, and of course, uh, I strongly believe, as ambassador of Mexico, that I back be a very successful product to export to Mexico, not just to consume here, but to export to Mexico. If you add to Ibar uh, some hot peppers uh -huh, and uh, send uh, to Mexico, it will be very, very, very successful. We are 130 million people there in Mexico. You can start with some uh, hotel chains or supermarket chains or restaurant chains in order to introduce this product, and I'm sure that it will be very, very, very successful. Uh, maybe also just to, to, to finish, uh, uh, the certification. Uh, your juristic uh, authorities maybe can organize something that is very useful in Mexico, uh, that they will certificate uh -huh, the restaurants uh, in order to verify that they follow the real traditional uh, receipts uh, of our country. And we deliver a big, nice plate uh -huh, in order to the entrance of the restaurant, say this restaurant is certificate of the Mexican authorities that serves authentic and Mexican food, no? for example. Yeah. That is very important in, in our case in order to promote uh, so that the people really follow uh, the, the traditional receipt, but also to standardize the quality of the food that we offer to the uh, touristic uh, sector. And of course, something additional that is very important is the appellation of origin. It's important also that you identify why exactly is your really national emblematic is the products and what's about this uh, idea of the uh, appellation of origin in order is the, to have a more emblematic uh, products that you can promote around the world. Yeah. Thank you so much. I am basically from Croatia, but I lived 20 years in Slovenia. I must say that Serbia is number one country for the gastronomy choice and from hospitality and uh, every each country in the region can learn a lot of from Serbia. This is because uh, long history of Serbian hospitality service. But unfortunately, I also must say like a communication expert that Serbia doesn't use, uh, doesn't enough promote uh, gastronomy enough so strong not only regionally, worldwide. So let's say now the... the, the yes, yes, it the, is uh, time to see uh, results. So we have a question in uh, restaurants, what is most important for me? So uh, how food look like, the taste of the food, the price of the food, the comfort, hospitality, let's say it's the cleanest of the toilet, hospitality of the waiters, the profile of the guests who come into this restaurant, or something else. So on the first place, of course, it's a taste of the food, 100%. The, the second, uh, it's uh, how uh, waiters treat us, 
and uh, the third is the, the how food it looks like, so from presentation of the food, then the cleanness of the toilet, then we have a, a price, and uh, the profile of the guest, and something else. So very interesting is that the price is not first, that people uh, in this room looking first of all for the taste of the food. So each of us have our taste of the food, how I mentioned in the beginning, in our receptors in the brain, we have a taste of our childhood, but uh, we must allow ourselves to taste another food. So first of all, I want to thank you, and uh, I hope so that you also learn something new about uh, different type of uh, cuisine. We was traveling today from the four continents. Thank you so much. Da pitamo samo publiku da li ima nekih pitanja. Any questions? Thank you. Hvala Daniele. Hvala vašim panelistima i gostima. A ima pitanja, dobro. Ima pitanja sa svi... Izvolite. Pitanje je upućeno ambasadorki Kanade. Obzirom da je porekla Mađarica, a da joj je suprug porekla iz Bosne i Hercegovine. Do you understand? So I will, I will just translate for the other ambassadors. So I have a question for, uh, for the ambassador of Canada because her husband is from? Bosnia. Bosnia. From Bosnia and she's from uh, Hungary. Yes, yeah, she's from Hungary. And, uh, uh -huh. people from the Twitter account ask uh, about her favorite Hungarian meal and her favorite Bosnian meal. <laughs> Well, um, on the Hungarian side, I would say a uh, couple of things. Actually, we heard about gombots. That's something that I also grew up uh, eating. The ones filled with plums uh, are delicious. On the meat side, I think you, a, a really good uh, guillage or a perkelt, a, a meat stew made from, from veal or, uh, or beef or, or pork. Those are all delicious things served, of course, with homemade uh, dumplings, nokedli. Uh, very uh, things that I grew up eating and that I that I really enjoy. Uh, on the Bosnian side, I would say uh, pita probably would be the the thing that is is number one in my heart. Of course, chivapčići, uh, as we we heard, it's you know it's a it's a regional favorite. But uh, my mother-in-law was one of the best makers of pita I've ever uh, I've ever met, and eating her homemade uh, you know pita made with her homemade dough and the, and spinach and cheese, uh, zedjanica, as they call it in Bosnia, or, or sirnica, uh, all really, really delicious. And, uh, and <laughs> unfortunately, she has passed away, So, and I never learned to make pastry like she did, so I cannot ever repeat it, yeah. but it was wonderful. So, thank you. Thank you, hvala. Ima li još neko pitanje? Dobro, hvala vam. Hvala, Daniele. Najlepše.